Hi, this is River Charles, and I'm here with our fellow, Dr. Alan Lim, and today we have another Kaleidoscope episode. So, hey, Alan, I have an interesting case I think you'd like to see. Hey, great. Thanks. I'm glad to be here. Tell me more about this case. So, the patient is in her 70s with a history of hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and chronic lymphocytic leukemia, who presents with chronic kidney disease. Serum creatinine is 2.0 milligrams per DL, nephrotic range proteinuria, and low serum albumin. Okay, so now what, what do we see on light microscopy? So starting with an overview using the trichrome stain, we can see the biopsy is, by light microscopy, is predominantly medulla, but there are some fragments of cortex that show mild to moderate interstitial fibrosis. Moving on to the PAS stain, we can see glomerular capillary loops are mildly or somewhat thickened. And then on silver stain, we could see there's minute, small holes uh, that are segmental, hard to appreciate. So to summarize by light, we see moderate interstitial fibrosis and tubular atrophy and some subtle, mild, atypical glomerular features of capillary loop uh, in the form of holes and spikes. Now, what does the biopsy show by immunofluorescence? So starting with the IgG immunofluorescence stain, we could see there's granular capillary loop staining. So moving to the kappa, we can see that there is, again, granular staining along the capillary loops. And with lambda, we could also see that there's granular staining along capillary loops. Wow, cool. So it looks like a membranous glomerulopathy, but what's going on in, with the background tubular interstitium? So good eye. So if we look back at another image of the kappa immunofluorescence, we can see that this is a fragment of medulla and we could see a bright three plus linear staining of the tubular basement membranes. But then when we go to lambda, we could see that there's no staining of the tubular basement membranes. The only staining we could see here is of uh, proximal tubular epithelium or the reabsorption droplets. That's interesting. So the IF shows two distinct staining patterns. There's both a membranous pattern, but also the TBM showed kappa restriction. Are there deposits on EM that match the IF deposits? Yeah, so if we look at electron microscopy here, we could see a capillary loop that shows numerous subepithelial electron dense deposits. So then here, if we look at another electron micrograph, we could see that this capillary loop here has numerous subepithelial deposits, but then there's other capillary loops like here and here that don't really have any deposits. So now moving on to the tubular basement membranes, we could see there are numerous powdery deposits lining the tubular basement membranes all along here. So to summarize, we have a segmental membranous glomerulopathy and kappa-restricted light chain deposition disease. Did you order any stains to further subtype the membranous glomerulopathy? I think NEL1 is known to have a segmental membranous pattern. Yeah, exactly. So we ordered PLA2R, NEL1 and THS7DA antigens for this case to further characterize the membranous glomerulopathy. Here we're looking at the NEL1 IHC stain, which shows glomerular capillary loop staining that match the uh, deposits that we're seeing on immunofluorescence. So this is a collision case of kappa light chain deposition disease and membranous glomerulopathy uh, NEL1 positive. So we have two distinct diseases in one case. What do we know about these two diseases, and are they somehow related? Yeah, so monoclonal immunoglobulin deposition disease, or MIDD, is a rare complication of abnormal B in plasma cells characterized by non-fibrillar Congo red negative deposits of monoclonal immunoglobulin molecules. LCDD is the most common subtype. This disease can involve several organs, uh, most commonly the kidneys, but it can also less commonly involve the liver and the heart. Treatment strategy in MIDD relies on chemotherapy targeting the underlying clone. And here we could see a chart from a nationwide retrospective cohort study published in Blood 2019, which showed that pure LCDD was associated with different conditions. Most commonly, um, you know, 82% of these pure LCD cases had an MGRS, 18.2% had symptomatic multiple myeloma, 2% had Waldenstrom's, and then less than a percent, they only had one case that was associated with CLL, and other B, B cell lymphomas are even less common. 
We could also see that LCDD can also be seen with cast nephropathy, and 100% of these cases were associated with symptomatic multiple myeloma. So in this case, the LCDD is likely secondary to the patient's underlying CLL. Could the no one positive membranous glomerulopathy also be secondary to the patient's CLL? Yeah, so a paper uh, written by Tiffany Kaza et al. showed that one-third of patients with NEL1 positive associated membranous glomerulopathy had a history of malignancy. And so if we look at this chart, they looked at 91 cases and found that 30 of these patients had an associated uh, malignancy. They had prostate, adenocarcinoma, breast, colon. Those were some of the more common associations, skin. Uh, and then notably, one patient had lymphoma. If you compare NEL1 associated membranous glomerulopathy, it has a much higher incidence of the patient having a malignancy compared to PLA2R and THS7DA and then unknown antigen cases. However, NEL1 associated membranous uh, nephropathy has also been associated with multiple drugs, including lipoic acid supplementation, traditional indigenous medicines, and busulamine use. So in this case, a, a full clinical history review is necessary to rule out other malignancies and supplements that could be causing the NEL1 membranous glomerulopathy. That's really interesting. Well, thank you all for joining us today, uh, and we hope to see you all again next time. Yeah.